Mm-hmm. And once again today, we'll see that Jesus has a lot to say to the Pharisees and about the Pharisees in this particular chapter. So we're going to be looking at a portion of Matthew chapter 23 today, and we'll be looking at the rest of the chapter in the next coming weeks. But we'll be looking at verses 1 through 13 today of Matthew chapter 23. So if you're able to, I'm going to stand me and join me on the honor of the reading of God's Word. If you'll follow along with me as I read our text for today. In Matthew chapter 23, the first 13 verses. In Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 1, it says this, Then then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do ye not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and lords the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called the men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be ye not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, neither go ye in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. It's pretty good. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. Father, you tell us that your word is inspired. It, It is breathed by the mouth of God. Your word is not dead. Your word is very much alive. And Father, I pray that while we're here today, you will not allow us to just hold your words in our hands. I pray that you will help us to do what you tell us to do in your word, which is to apply your words to our hearts. Lord, you give us your word for many reasons. For encouragement, for instruction in righteousness, but also for reproof and correction. So Father, I ask you to help us to be honest with ourselves, to be honest with you, to see if there's any of these characteristics that you point out about the Pharisees present in our lives today. And Father, I pray that you will help us to look for ways of how we can apply this text to our lives. I ask you to challenge us. I ask you to, to change us so that we can become more like you and better fulfill your purpose for our lives. Holy Spirit, as always, nobody needs to hear from me, but we all need to hear from you. And I ask you to speak to me, as you speak through me, keep me from saying anything that would be of my own will or of my own volition. I pray that everything that's done here today will be said only for your glory and your honor. And as always, we pray these things in the perfect, precious, and powerful name of Jesus. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can take your seats. This is a difficult passage in some respects because Jesus touches on some attitudes here that if we're honest we've either seen displayed by other Christians or that we've probably unfortunately displayed ourselves and Jesus does not mince words here he's very straightforward he's very direct about certain attitudes and actions that the Pharisees exhibited that he was displeased with and What we have to understand is this. If Jesus was displeased when the Pharisees exhibited these behaviors, he's still just as displeased with us when we display these attitudes. As we look at this text, we always try to view Scripture through three lenses. Information, explanation, and application. Information is what does the text say? Explanation is what does this text mean? An application is, what does this text mean for me? What can I learn from this teaching? Because without question, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees here, but he wants us to get something out of this. There are some things that Jesus says in this text that he wants us to learn so that we can identify and guard against, and if necessary, to remove certain things from our lives. Jesus describes the Pharisees 
using words and descriptions that make it clear how he feels about those who portray these characteristics. And you'd be hard-pressed to find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus speaks to a group of people using a harsher tone than he does with the Pharisees. So what is it about the Pharisees that displeased Jesus so much? What is it that angered him so much? What attitudes did they display that caused such a strong response from him? Well, the first thing we're going to see about the Pharisees is that they were phony. If you like to take notes or follow along with the message, the outline is on the back of the bulletin. And the first point we see today about the Pharisees is that they were phony. At the end of verse 3, Jesus said this about the Pharisees. They say and do not. Then in verse 4 he says, They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. The term Pharisee has come to be equated with someone who demonstrates these qualities we see in verses 3 and 4. Someone who likes to tell other people what they should do, but they don't actually do it themselves. Pharisees are those who can be summed up by this model. Follow my instructions, not my actions. And the reason why is, they were phony. And we've seen over the past couple weeks, so this is not groundbreaking news, but not everybody with a quote-unquote spiritual title is genuinely walking with Christ. Right. Not everyone who has a spiritual right. title has your best interest in mind. That's right. Jesus made it clear that not every person who claims to follow him, not every person who comes to church, not every person that acts spiritual is actually genuine or authentic in their faith. Jesus said himself, there's a lot of phonies. You say, well, where did Jesus say that? Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Just a few pages earlier in our Bible, Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, yep. have we not prophesied in your name? He cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works. And remember what Jesus' response is? I, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. If you look up the word Pharisee in the thesaurus, one of the first synonyms listed is this word, phony. <laughs> now once again, as I said last week, none of us is perfect. We all fail. We all fall short repeatedly. But what we have to understand is that Jesus showed a certain level of indignation and disdain reserved for those who exhibit this particular attitude. Those who present themselves as spiritual and tell people to do things that they don't do themselves. People who, as verse 4 says, make things difficult for others and offer them no assistance. Hmm. Jesus said in verse 4, they bind heavy burdens, grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And if you notice, if you look there at verse 4, there are two parts of this verse. There's a semicolon that separates the first part from the second part of verse 4. The, and the first thing that Jesus points out is that those with a Pharisee mindset place heavy burdens on people. In other words, they make things more difficult for people. Yes. And there are some Christians, some churches then in order to fit in, you have to meet certain criteria. You have to dress a certain way or act a certain way. You have to raise your kids a certain way. You have to have certain political views. You have to have certain standards about music or dress or versions of the Bible. And if you don't check all those boxes, you just don't fit in. If you keep your place here, we'll see how Jesus addressed these issues. If you turn back just a few pages to Matthew chapter 11. Keep your spot here, Matthew chapter 23. But turn back to Matthew chapter 11. And once you get there, look down at verse 28. Now, if you have a red letter Bible, you'll notice that these are the words of Christ here. This isn't me making this up. These are the words of Jesus. And look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus doesn't say, come unto me, those of you who meet certain criteria. He doesn't say, come unto me, some of you, who have specific standards. He doesn't say, some of you are welcome, but some of you aren't. Jesus didn't say, come unto me, all you who dress a certain way, or worship a certain way, 
or have certain political views or certain standards on Bible versions or styles of worship. He said, come unto me all. All ye who are tired, all you who are hurting, all you who are weary, he says, come unto me and I'll give all of you rest. Amen. Now we saw last week how Jesus told the Pharisees, he told the followers of John, he even said to his own disciples, that they that are whole need not a physician, but they who are sick. Jesus said, I didn't come for the righteous. I came for sinners. Yes. Jesus said, sinners are why I came. Sinners are why I left heaven. Sinners are why I died. Sinners are, ro are why I rose again. But the Pharisees didn't get it. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those that are bruised. Jesus said, The poor... The brokenhearted, the captives, the blind, the bruised. Jesus said, that's why I came, not you spiritual phonies. Yeah. These are the people I came for, not who, those of you who want to act spiritual and act like you're better than everybody else. Jesus said, I came for the people who don't fit in with quote unquote spiritual folks. That's what Jesus said. That's why I came. And I couldn't even begin to tell you how many stories I've heard from other Christians about some of the ways they've been made to feel unwelcome or inferior when they visit some other churches. I couldn't tell you how many times I've been looked at a little sideways by other Christians because I don't fit into the mold of what they think a pastor or a Christian should be. You know what that is? It's a Pharisee mindset. Placing burdens or expectations on people that God doesn't place on them. Listen, I'm not talking about standards. I'm not saying we shouldn't have any standards or have any convictions. That is not what I'm saying. But if you have a conviction that isn't supported by Scripture, you don't have a conviction, you have a preference. And what preferences are, really, are more important sounding opinions. My football coach in high school, the guy, uh, Coach Carroll, Coach Wayne Carroll, and he was a man of few words, but when he spoke, I listened. And I remember him telling me, because he knew me, I, I, I don't like to make waves. I like people to like me. I don't like when I upset people. <clears throat> but I remember him telling me, you know, if you're going to play quarterback, you're going to have some people that are going to have opinions about you. And I remember him telling me, I, I always remember, he said, um, opinions are like noses. Everybody has one, and most of them smell. So when we look back at our text in Matthew chapter 23, when you look at verses 3 and 4, we see here that the Pharisees had opinions. They had very strong preferences for the ways that things should be done. That's why we see in verse 3, they weren't shy about speaking up and telling other people what they should do. And in verse 4, we see how they weren't shy about speaking up and about telling other people about their expectations, not God's. Now, how their preferences, not God's, can be a burden that other people felt that they had to live up to. And can I just say something? I, I'm not perfect. I, I'm going to mess up over and over and over again. And I'm so thankful and so grateful for this church that understands and accepts how imperfect I am, but is gracious enough to love me and support me and follow the direction I believe that God is leading us. But can I tell you something? If you have to choose between living up to a church's standards or God's standards, if you have to choose between living up to a pastor's standards or God's standards, 100 times out of 100, choose God. Amen. Amen. That's right. And listen, as you grow in your walk with Christ, as you mature and develop in your faith, there are going to be some challenges. That's just how it is. Jesus said in John 16, 33, In this world ye shall have tribulation. Yes. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 12 and says, All who live, in, who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're going to grow, you're going to go through some growing pains. But here's what we have to remember. When we see someone maybe newer in their faith, when we see someone who is growing in their faith, or even struggling with their faith, even when we see someone whose standards and convictions don't line up with our own, 
We have to make sure we don't become like the Pharisees and become a burden to them. Yeah. I'm always struck by verse 4. How Jesus said that these spiritual sounding, spiritual acting people <clears throat> place heavy, grievous burdens on others. And the reason why that is so striking to me is because it's so unlike Christ. Mm -hmm. In 1 Peter 5, 7, Jesus said, Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. In Psalm 55, 22, it says, Cast all your burden on the Lord. We reference Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I won't add to your burdens, I'll give you rest. In verse 29, he goes on and says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. And then verse 30, he says, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen. Are we seeing a disconnect here? Are we seeing the problem here? Pharisees add to people's burdens. <laughs> Jesus takes burdens off of people. And here's the thing. If we as individual Christians, or we as a church, if we add to other people's burdens... If we have certain expectations that we expect people to live up to before they're welcome here, who are we living more like, the Pharisees or Jesus? If we're adding burdens to people, instead of taking burdens off of people, you can call yourself whatever you want, but you're living like a Pharisee. You're not living like Christ. And that's the first part of verse 4, but if you'll look with me after that semicolon, the first part of verse 4, Jesus says the Pharisees add these burdens to people, then at the end of the verse, he says this, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Mm -hmm. Now, this might sound really harsh and blunt, but Jesus said it, and I believe he meant it to be very blunt and direct. If you see somebody struggling, if you see somebody burdened by something, but you don't lift a finger to help, you can call yourself a Christian all you want. You can dress up in your Sunday clothes all you want. You can act or think you're better than other people all you want. But Jesus said, if you see someone who's struggling and you don't do anything to relieve that burden, you might not identify, as a, identify yourself as a Pharisee, but God will call you a Pharisee. Because hmm. that's how Pharisees lived. All right. Amen. Yes. Very clearly, what Jesus was trying to get through is that it's not good enough to just act spiritual. <laughs> we talked about how the, the source in the dictionary... Some of the synonyms for Pharisee is phony. And the next one that comes up on that list is hypocrite. And we see the extent to which Jesus calls the Pharisees out for being hypocrites later in this chapter. If you look a little bit later through this chapter, seven times in verses 13 through 29, Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And if you notice, each time he uses an exclamation point. He means business. He's serious about this point, about not being hypocrites. Jesus goes out of his way seven times in a matter of 13, 14, 15 verses to make it clear just how much we should avoid being hypocrites. And we're going to look at some of those warnings next week, but we see here in verses 3 and 4 some attitudes that we need to avoid so that we don't act like the Pharisees, so we don't act like hypocrites. And among them we see we shouldn't be telling people how to live without living spiritually ourselves. We should be placing undue burdens on, and unnecessary expectations on people. And we shouldn't fail to help people when we see those who are burdened. So the first attribute that Jesus points out about the Pharisees is that they were phony. And next we see they were proud. In the book of verse 5, Jesus said the Pharisees do all their works to be seen of men. Hmm. In verse 6, he said they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Yep. In verse 7, he said they, they love to be recognized and be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Now, if you look at, back at verse 5, there's something important to understand. The Pharisees did some good things. Yes. They did some right things, but they did them for the wrong reasons. That's right, amen. Jesus said they only did things to get recognized. They craved attention. And we see the extent that they went to to get attention in those verses. In verse 5, Jesus said they made broad their phylacteries. Now, what is a phylactery? Is it something bad? Am I wearing a phylactery not even knowing it? Well, a phylactery was a small leather box containing pieces of parchment that had scriptures written on them. Mm -hmm. 
And the Pharisees would strap these boxes to their head or to their left arm in literal obedience to Deuteronomy 11.18 where Jesus said, Lay up these my words on your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. At the end of verse 5, Jesus said the Pharisees enlarged the borders of their garments. Now this is referring to the fringe of a garment where tassels or cords would be attached. And again, this has its basis in the Old Testament, back in Numbers chapter 15, verses 38 and 39, where God spoke to Moses and told him to instruct the children of Israel to make fringes in the borders of the garments and attach blue ribbons or blue cords to them. And verse 39 says that the purpose was so that they would look at those cords and remember the commandments of the Lord and do them. That's right. So if you look back at our text, you'll notice there, Jesus doesn't condemn them for wearing phylacteries or fringes on their clothes. So if you want to walk around with a box of scripture on your head or your arm, be my guest. But Jesus calls them out for making an excessive show mm -hmm. just so people will notice them. So we see their pride demonstrated here in ways that maybe we can't really relate to. You know, I don't know of anybody today that would just walk around with a box on their head and say, oh, yeah, I got, I got Bible verses here in case you're wondering. <laughs> kind of strange. You know, I, I don't know if I... I don't think I've ever seen anybody that would enlarge the border of their shirt just to see if people would notice. Yeah, if I'm looking at Nelson, ooh, did you see the border of Nelson's shirt today? Oh, man. And Emily, oh, look at Emily. Emily's got the biggest border on the garment I've ever seen. The fringes on her clothes, are, they, they got to be at least six inches longer than mine. She's so much holier and cooler than I am. We, we wouldn't do that. It's not relevant to, or relatable to us today. But when we get to verses 6 and 7, we see some other aspects of their pride. Verse 6 says they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the best seats in synagogues. Mm -hmm. So what we see here, once again, about the Pharisees, it, it wasn't just enough for them to be invited to a special event. They had to be seen mm -hmm. when they were there. In the layman's terms, it wasn't enough for them to be in church. They had to be seen in church. They had to be recognized. They needed attention. Because their M.O., as Jesus said earlier, was that everything they do, they do to be seen of men. Now, once again, these examples are the complete opposite of what Jesus taught. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus said in verse 8, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room. Verse 10, he said, But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Yep. And thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sat at meat with thee. But back in our text, in verse 6, it says they love the chief seats in the synagogues, and, those were the, and the reason why is those were the seats that were closest to the law. And the thing is about the Pharisees, they didn't want to sit closest to the law just so they could hear better or anything like that. It's because when people came to the synagogue, they didn't have their own copies of God's word the way we do today. When people came to the synagogue, their attention was focused on where the law was posted. So the Pharisees would show up and they would jockey for position to sit close to the law once again. So that when people were looking at the law, they would inevitably be seen by men. Hmm. It's all about attention. Hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm liking these guys less and less the more we learn about them. <laughs> but then in verse 7, uh -huh. Jesus says, They love greetings in the marketplace and be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Now, I'm going to try to not get myself into trouble here. Because I've heard some preaching on this. I've had men that I really respect that take a very different position on this than I do. But the Pharisees needed to be recognized when they went somewhere. And, and let me start by saying this. We shouldn't intentionally ignore or overlook anybody. We should never ignore anybody <coughs> on the purpose. That should never happen. But if you get bent out of shape and upset when you don't get noticed or recognized, you know what you're acting like? Yeah, don't do that. And sometimes that means we just have to give people a little bit of grace. If someone doesn't say hello or shake your hand or remember your second cousin's name that came to church 14 years ago, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you're blowing you, that they're blowing you off. It could just mean that they were distracted or preoccupied by something else. In, in, in total honesty, I would hate for anybody to come here and feel unwelcome or unappreciated. Mm. I would hate that. So if I don't say hello or shake your hand, please know that's not the intention. That's not intentional. In fact, if I don't shake your hand today, come back next week, I'll shake it twice to make up for it. I promise. <laughs> and uh, we're joking, but let's be honest. If you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard someone get upset or been on shape over something like this. They didn't get the recognition they felt they deserved. Hmm. 
There might even be times when you've been tempted to feel that way. To take things personally that weren't intended to be personal. But we have to remember, that's not how Jesus acted. Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 said that Jesus made himself with no reputation. That's right. So even if you're not welcomed or greeted the way you think you should be, you still have to respond the right way. And the last part of verse 7, I'll admit, is it's a little bit personal for me. And this is where I'm going to try to not get in any trouble. But I've got a little bit of a pet peeve, if you will, about verse 7. Jesus said in verse 7, the Pharisees love to be called the men, Rabbi, Rabbi. And I mentioned this earlier. There are differing views on this. But my personal opinion is that titles are overrated. You know, I, some, I know some pastors kind of insist on being called pastor or reverend or whatever because they say it's a sign of respect, and, and I get that. But I just don't feel any type of disrespect if people call me by my first name. You know, when, God call, when God speaks to me, he doesn't call me pastor. When the Holy Spirit speaks to me, and I'm glad he does, not once has he referred to me as Pastor Garrett M. Hall the first. So I don't take offense to people if they don't call me a, a, by a specific title. A lot of you have literally known me my entire life. My whole life. So if people call me by my name, it's not that they're criticizing me or calling me a bad name. It's like actually, literally, my name. And you can ask Jess, we dated for a while. We might have even been engaged before she actually knew my government birth certificate first name. Even now, she, she hardly ever calls me Garrett. When she met me as G, so she, that's what she calls me. So I personally would feel a little pretentious if I insist on people calling me a specific title. Now, I'm not gonna, one that's going to be offended if you call me by my first name or nickname. That just doesn't really matter to me. But when I look back at verse 7, what I see is that just because someone has a spiritual title doesn't mean they're a spiritual person. Right. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would much rather be known as a spiritual person than just be a person that has a spiritual title. Mm -hmm. But what we see here with the Pharisees, we see the pride they had. Their pride was so out of control that it affected how they dressed, where they sat, and what people called them. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus said in verse 5, everything they did, they did for the purpose of getting attention. Mm -hmm. So we've seen so far that the Pharisees were phony, they were proud. And finally today we're going to see why these characteristics are such a big problem. Finally today we see that the Pharisees prevented people from coming to Christ. If you look at verse 13, Jesus says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. What Jesus was saying is that even though the Pharisees might have looked spiritual, even though they might have seemed spiritual, they were actually keeping people out yes. of heaven. Right. One study I used when preparing for this message said this about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were supposed to show people the way into the kingdom of heaven. Mm. This should have been through faith and obedience to God. Instead, they built and enforced a mountain of additional rules while securing their own power and status. This ensured that they and those who followed their teaching would never enter the kingdom. And it goes on and says this, those who should have been guides and gatekeepers had come to block the gate, mm. keeping people out instead of welcoming them in. Mm. This is why we have to understand who the Pharisees were. This is why we have to be familiar with their attitudes and their actions and so that we don't become them. Those who should have been guides had come to block the gate, hmm. keeping people out, instead of welcoming them in. You might say, well, I'm not a Pharisee. As a church, we're not Pharisees, no. But we can still unintentionally be keeping people out of God's kingdom. Right. How? If we're hypocrites. Hmm. If we're proud. And if we place extra, unnecessary, man-made burdens on people. Mark it down. If, you're, if we are a proud church, if we are a hypocritical church, and if we have unnecessary extra-biblical standards, we will keep, up, keep people out of heaven. If you say one thing and live another way, people will see that and they will want nothing to do with you or your God. If people look at me and I come across as someone who burdens them with expectations that they have to live up to in order to be accepted, 
in order to be welcome or in order to fit in. If we as a church were to place expectations or burdens on people, if we see people that are struggling and don't do anything to help them, if we only go to church, if we only do spiritual things so we get noticed by people that are there, to get recognition, to make no mistake about it, we will keep people out of heaven. Mm. Jesus said the Pharisees' phoniness and their pride kept people from coming into a relationship with God. And the same is true for us. If we say and do not. As verse 4 says, if we place undue burdens on people, if we have our own standards and preferences instead of welcoming people to Christ, we will turn people away from that. What we can learn from these Pharisees is that our attitudes will either keep the door open for people to get saved, or our attitudes and our actions will close that door so that we have no interest in getting saved. Amen. And we mentioned the past two weeks what the statistics show. Only one out of 20 18 to 35 year olds are active in their faith. Over two thirds of kids and teens that grew up in church stopped going completely between the ages of 18 and 22. 70% of those in the, between the ages of 18 and 29 that grew up in church withdraw from church involvement as adults. Do you remember the three reasons given? They perceive the church to be judgmental, hypocritical, and irrelevant. Mm. In fact, I mentioned this in Sunday school this morning. Research shows that the number one reason by teens that grew up in Christian homes is the reason why they show no spiritual interest in church when they become adults was that they viewed their parents as hypocrites. They learned about love and patience and grace and forgiveness at church, but didn't see it lived out in their own homes. They experienced the judgmental spirit that their church had towards any person or church who didn't line up with their standards. And they felt that the teachings and standards promoted so strongly were largely irrelevant. Now, if we can hear those types of statistics and choose to do nothing about it, if we can hear those types of statistics and say, well, I don't care what they think. We're going to keep doing things the way we've always done them. You know what that is? It's pride. Mm. Wow. You know, I, I heard years ago, I was um, speaking at a church that was looking for a pastor. And one of the people there said, you know what, I know, I know our church needs to change. We need to do some things differently. We don't have any young families. We don't have any young people, so we need to do some things differently. And this person, I don't know how old they were, probably in their 80s by this point. She said, I, I know the church needs to change. And when I die, they can do whatever they want. But as long as I'm here, I don't want them to change anything. <laughs> And we can kind of laugh at that and chuckle and say, but I, I, I'm not, that person was not kidding. She'd always done church a certain way, and she didn't want church to be done differently. Now, what we have to ask ourselves is that it really what, what comes to, if that's the, the attitude that we take, where the church can change worship styles or convictions or standards over my dead body, you know what will happen? Someday you will, in fact, die. And the changes that needed to take place to reach your own children and your own grandchildren, it might already be too late by then to make those changes. Right. Right. It might be too late for your grandkids. It might already be part of those statistics. It, it, again, I'm not saying we shouldn't have standards, but pick any conviction, preference, or standard you want and ask yourself this. Am I okay with this being what keeps my grandchild from a relationship with Christ? Because listen, we all have standards. We all have convictions. We all have preferences. But I'll say one thing. There's not one single standard that I have that's more important to me than my daughters coming to know Christ and continuing to walk with them yeah. throughout their lives. Yeah. So we have to be careful that we don't become like the Pharisees and hold on so tightly to our own preferences, our own standards, and our own convictions that instead of actually inviting people to Christ, we end up turning them away. Because what we see here, without question, from Jesus' words himself, is if we have or hold on to standards, as tightly as the way the Pharisees did, they don't want to change, they don't want to do anything differently. It was that that kept others from coming to the kingdom of God. Now, again, we, as I mentioned at the beginning of this in the introduction, this isn't just the point fingers of the Pharisees. But we have to understand, God preserved his word for us to get something out of this. Church isn't just for us to come and meet and do things how we like it. 
Our purpose, Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost. And if that's not our vision, if our mission is just to kind of come to church and have church done the way it's always been so I can feel comfortable, we've completely missed the point. Mm-hmm. And God forbid if it, be, if it be said of us when we stand before the Lord, if he says, you know what, I had a lot more people that would have been willing to come into my kingdom, but you kept them out because of your own preferences and your own standards. That's what the Pharisees did. We're close today with that our repetition of our title, don't be a Pharisee. So, well, everybody head bowed, every eye closed. Because they will invite this gentleman forward for a time's invitation.